Hi everybody, welcome to this video where I will give you valuable insights from my cycling experiences into many different countries and what makes them easy or hard to cycle through. To be clear, with easy, I mean enjoyable without vast bicycle touring experience. And hard doesn't mean unenjoyable, but in a general sense requires more skill, experience, and in cases, cultural knowledge. In fact, harder can be highly rewarding because of those challenges. Instead of me summing up all the countries on a scale from easy to hard, I will try and break down the essence into different aspects on what makes a country feel a certain way and use my experiences as examples. Let's take a look at culture first. An immense diversity of perceptions and actions in place and through time. And with all things combined, we find ourselves living in a reality we might never come to understand. And yet, this imperfection shapes and drives a richness in culture that makes for such an incredible world to explore. The first thing that stands out when entering a country is probably the language. Depending on your particular language skill, you might be a complete beginner. We experienced that in the majority of countries we visited. Especially where the language is further from our roots, it's harder to get our head around. For us, that was in places like Southeast Asia and Japan. It's not that difficult to learn some basics and the locals will almost in all cases react with a smile if you try and speak a bit of their native tongue. It's one of my favorite things, seeing people's eyes light up when greeting them or asking a simple question. However, it's definitely hard in that case to have an in-depth conversation and as such you will miss a deeper understanding of what moves people in their lives. Being fluent for me is personally such a huge plus. I love chatting with the locals and have interesting discussions about all kinds of topics. Great Britain stands out as a place where we had the most amazing conversations with random people. It makes everything so much easier from simply asking for a place to sleep to discussing philosophical theories. That's your thing. It's one of the big pleasures and a big reason why I think travel is so amazing. Religion is an important factor that influences the way the locals shape their culture. From big ideas about how life originated to smaller daily rituals. In many places religion infuses a very distinctive rhythm and atmosphere. The mosques in Turkey for example that call to prayer five times a day. It's a very specific presence in everyday life. Definitely a thing we had to get used to, especially when being woken up in the very early hours. Where things got a bit more personal was when Maori was mandatory to wear a headscarf in Iran. There was a partial sacrifice of her freedom to wear what she normally likes. Or in this case, even putting on something extra. Also long sleeves were highly advised for men and women. This is a sensitive subject and should be taken seriously by anyone wanting to visit. It can be tough to change personal behavior, but realize you're only visiting for a brief moment. But for the locals, it's their way of life. Unfortunately, many places have regional problems. Complex factors contribute to unrest, instability and even war. In Tajikistan, cyclists got attacked and killed by terrorists while we were planning to go and cycle there. This had a profound effect on us and we contemplated not going there because of this horrible but singular event. Even while cycling there, eventually, besides the challenging terrain, it was never far from our minds, making the whole experience harder to get our heads around. Bad things happen everywhere and it's essential to be mindful of what's happening in broad strokes and adjust accordingly depending on the severity of the situation. From deserts, humid jungles, arctic winter and everything in between, a country's climate will dictate how you prepare. Even within the borders there can be lots of variations, so it's key to see all variables on your route and let that be a guide in your gear choices and mental preparation. Most often we experience the weather as being quite okay and life outside is fairly straightforward and enjoyable. There are some specific situations though where getting things done is harder or even dangerous. A hot climate will often bring lots of heat and intense sun, which presents several risks. In the deserts of Oman and Morocco, it was hot even when we're there outside of the summer months. Sunburn can be a real danger and throughout the years we have learned to protect ourselves better and better. 
With heat often comes the possibility of dehydration and typically water is scarce in desert environments. You tend to sweat a lot to cool the body down and water becomes an even more important commodity to plan for and secure within your itinerary. Finding shade can be a problem in wide open areas. Couple that with dehydration, sunburn, hypothermia, the body overheating, and things could eventually lead to a fatally dangerous heat stroke if not diagnosed and treated adequately. There's pure magic to experience in the desert, but it can be one of the hardest places to deal with the raw elements if things go sideways. If there's one aspect of the weather I love and hate almost equally, it's the cold. It often brings the beauty of a landscape to a whole other level when graced with the beauty of snow and ice. Also, pretty frequently the weather is just nasty and the cold makes you wish for a cozy place inside next to the stove. Everything becomes much more challenging in the cold. From icy rain, frozen water and bike parts to more serious matters like frostbite and hypothermia or the undercooling of the body's core temperature. But with proper preparation, it can be highly rewarding to being able to stay out comfortably in such conditions. In most cases, the weather changes from season to season, so it's hard to pinpoint a specific country to being cold outside of the specific regions like the Arctic. Moisture falling in the form of rain, hail, snow is one of the more regular and tough things to deal with. Just like the cold, it's often dependent on the season, how much precipitation is expected to fall. In warmer months, generally there is less volume and it's easier to deal with. The warmth of summer means things dry easier and you feel less uncomfortable and it can even be a welcome change to the heat of the day. On the other hand, the warmth can create unstable weather patterns that can cause massive summer rains accompanied with thunderstorms. We experienced that in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Cambodia. Quite scary actually, and certainly a thing to keep an eye out for. A cyclist nemesis or best friend, the wind can break or make a ride. When at the back it's a joy, but full on non-stop headwind is like climbing a mountain that isn't there. It's frustrating to say the least, and in our experience it was never more true than in Iceland. A local even told us that the naming of Iceland was wrong and should be called Windland, as it seemingly never stops blowing there. We had a couple of our toughest days with a full on headwind in the West Fjords. The wind blowing constantly over your ears makes it extra draining as the loud rustle is a whole other thing to deal with. Luckily we can say that for the vast majority of our travels the wind has been very mild in general. I hope that this has some promise for the future. From mountain to sea, it's a tiny sentence that encapsulates all the surfaces on earth we ride on. Completely flat or steep frozen mountainous terrain and everything in between. There is possibly no easier country to cycle than my native home of the Netherlands. Seeing anything that resembles a hill is a sight to behold. Netherlands literally means lower countries and as such is ideally suited to ride a bike. Combine that with perhaps the most excellent cycling path network in the world and it's no wonder there are so many bikes here. Contrast that with a place like Tajikistan. Big natural scenery where people live deep in the mountains, getting increasingly more sparsely populated the higher you climb. There are many different topographies and countries can have a multitude of zones associated with them, making cycling more or less straightforward. Deserts, jungles, plains, mountains among others all have their challenges and rewards. What can set them apart is the amount of resources poured into making roads to ride on. In Japan we cycled a part of the island of Shikoku, still a pretty wild feeling place with lots of steep forested mountains. It was amazing to see to what lengths the Japanese have gone to build and maintain asphalt roads to an almost perfect degree. Although still tough to cycle the steep inclines, the smooth road surface made it so much easier. When we were in the Sahara Desert of Morocco, on the other hand, it was quite flat but the tracks were very very rocky or non-existent and the experience felt more like riding a donkey from time to time. 
It has been the most demanding stretch of cycling we ever did with no real elevation differences. Without the right material needs and experience, wild landscapes are extremely hard to navigate for longer stretches. It quickly becomes a survival ordeal only a very few among us can tackle with success. Civilization has changed the surface of the planet to cater to our needs and has made long distance travel relatively easy with the proper planning. Water is among the highest on the list of survival priorities and it was never more clear to us than again in the Sahara Desert. We knew it was going to be a sparse stretch but there were going to be water points. But without being exactly sure when and precisely where, we stocked upon 10 liters of water each before heading out just to be on the safe side. When we did find water, we filtered it to make it safe to drink. As a backup, we had purifying tablets and the possibility of boiling water to kill harmful pathogens. In many countries throughout Europe, we were able to drink the water straight from the tap. In most places, we could just ask about anybody to have our water bottles topped up. Even in remote places, we often came across a house or a farm or a random tap and we never seriously ran out of water. In places like Southeast Asia, the water quality is such that we could easily get sick from drinking it. Our water filter at that time had issues and combined with the fact that we wanted to take it a bit more leisurely that stretch, we bought water bottles to make life on the road a bit easier. As a cyclist, the fuel to get going is the energy we get from our food. In civilized places all over the world, the possibilities are quite similar, albeit being it in varying quality, quantity and choice. If you cook yourself like we often do, markets and supermarkets are the places to go to to buy what you fancy. Deep in the mountains of Tajikistan, the choice in produce was quite poor compared to our Western standards. But with some resourcefulness, we could get some simple vegetables, fruits, pasta, rice and local bread to create some relatively nourishing meals. The ubiquitous candy bars were welcome to get us over low energy points. Actually, it's quite unbelievable until you have seen it for yourself what you're still able to get in such an extremely remote place as the high plateau along the Pamir Highway. In Iceland, the supermarkets can be quite far apart depending on where you are cycling, so a bit of planning is mandatory. Like any modern Western country, choices are plentiful, but the prices are quite a bit higher compared to what we are used to. That gives buying a balanced diet without breaking the bank a new dimension in budget control. A place to shelter, get clean, warm up and have a good night's sleep is about as important as the rest on this list. We wild camp a lot because we enjoy it and it's a great way to stretch our budget. Especially in the more expensive countries in Western Europe, it's just not affordable for us to stay in hotels all the time. The expenses would skyrocket and if we do, it would instantly drain our budget and adventure possibilities. It wasn't until we hit Turkey our budget was able to allow for regular hotel stays to satisfy us with some well-deserved creature comforts. In Southeast Asia we knew hostel prices were going to be relatively cheap and wild camping more difficult as there are curious people just about everywhere. It was a nice change after about a year and a half on the bikes to be able to get to a hotel, book a room and be set without the hassle of having to find and set up a suitable camp spot. It's hard to know where you will end up, what the possibilities are, how the road conditions and the weather is going to be. Public transportation is fantastic for those times when you feel or have the need to make a change. In most countries there are possibilities, but in some places it's definitely going to be more difficult to organize than others. In Uzbekistan, we had to take multiple transport options to skip the stretch we wanted to. First a train from Kazakhstan, with the border control entering the train deep in the night to check our passports. A slow, long, busy ramble with a chaotic atmosphere at first. When we settled in though, we had a great time with the people and enjoyed the scenic ride. After that, we had to take a taxi, which turned out to be a big hassle. Part of that was a communication failure. 
but it also turned out to be a very different way of doing business. Haggling, no set departure time, unexpected transfers, and perhaps riding the worst highway we have ever seen. In hindsight, one of our highlights, but in the experience itself, quite a challenge. To contrast that with a highly organized country like Japan, public transport was too big a cut to our budget to consider. Also, the Japanese are very strict and getting luggage and bikes on board can be impossible if it's against the set rules. Trying to book an affordable flight with the bikes and luggage to Southeast Asia also provided to be a big challenge, with Maori spending about six busy hours to book a flight right at the airport. In the end, she was helped by a lady in India on the phone to get the deal done. Every country has its pros and cons when it comes to cycling there. Depending on your wishes, you might want to experience all flavors to get a sense of what the world has to offer. It's good to know in general what you can expect without digging too deep to leave the possibility for discovery and wonder. I want to thank Jay for coming up with the initial idea for this video. And if you want to know more about how to prepare for travel by bike, check out the video right here.